morning. Happy Father's Day. Hey, quick update on the Father's Day giveaway. Uh, I think the link wasn't working initially, but it's working now. So you can go to that sign up and events and sign up for the Father's Day giveaway if you haven't already. I'm not eligible, so... Anyway, tears. So, uh, hey, I'm Mark Porter. I'm the executive pastor here. If I've not met you, I would love to meet you after the service. And we're in week three of our uh, series on parables, how the stories of Jesus impact our stories. And uh, I just want to tell you right up front today, uh, we're going to look at three parables real quickly. But uh, they surround basically the authority. The, uh, our, the question was about authority, but it's about authority, obedience, and judgment. So happy Father's Day, everybody. Um, uh, They're kind of gut punches. I'll just be quite honest. But uh, this is something that Jesus spoke to, and so it must be really important. And not only did he speak to it, but he spoke to it in a very specific time in his ministry. And I'm going to show you a picture here you're not going to be able to read, which just seems very helpful, right? This is a timeline of Holy Week. Okay, Jesus enters here. The triumphal entry, Palm Sunday, and down here is Easter Sunday. And here we're going to zoom in on Monday, Tuesday of that week, and Jesus is uh, entering into the temple, and he is uh, teaching. And uh, we're actually uh, on Tuesday of Holy Week. So this is the final week of Jesus' life, and so he has to communicate some things that are really, really important because the cross is looming, Right? And so Monday he comes into the temple and he cleanses the temple and he turns over the tables. And then Tuesday he comes back and he's going to be challenged by the religious leaders, by the Pharisees and the religious teachers of the day about his authority. And that's where we're going to join the conversation. And the religious leaders are there. So if you're a churchy person, kind of you would consider yourself an insider, we should pay attention. But the crowds were there. So if you're an outsider, you're like, I'm not sure about faith. Pay attention, there's something for you too. And his disciples were there and they're teaching in the temple courts. And basically the challenge is around, is Jesus who he really says he is? Is he the king? Is he the Messiah? Is he God's son? So here's what it says in Matthew 21, 23. These are, uh, Jesus entered the temple courts and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of people came to him and said this, By what authority are you doing these things, they ask, and who gave you this authority? Now, we love that word authority, right? Everybody loves authority, right? And and we tend to kind of, I don't know, bow up against authority, rebel against authority, doubt authority, whether it's a political authority, scientific authority, right, or authority at school, whatever it is, we don't like that word. So what is authority really? Authority is really about three things, okay? And this is what Jesus was being challenged about. It's about power, it's about jurisdiction, and it's about permission. And if I'm honest this morning, I don't doubt Jesus' power, I don't doubt his dominion or jurisdiction in this world, but sometimes I don't want to give him permission in all areas of my life the permission to make and take decisions. Authority is about power, jurisdiction, and permission. So I wanna ask you a question as we start out today, who or what has authority in your life? Who or what has rule and reign in my life? Doug referenced this last week. Rule and reign, and you may say, hey, it's Jesus, but really think every area of your life your relationships, your finances, your sexuality, your friendships, whether you extend mercy, your kindness, generosity, all these things, does he have rule and reign in my life? And I've been struggling through these parables as I prepare because it's just a gut punch. It's like, wow, do I really, really trust his authority? Does he really have rule and reign in my life? Because ultimately, that's what sin is, right? It's a power struggle with God. Do I trust you enough to put all of my weight on you? And I was thinking about this analogy. I brought this with me today. Some of you guys know what this is. This is a carabiner, right? And you use this for 
uh, mountain climbing and rappelling. And this little piece of metal, right, you put it on a harness and you run ropes through this and then you, you click in. And some of our youth are gonna go to camp next week and they're gonna get to rappel and they're gonna trust this piece of metal to hold them, right? And you clip in and then you, I hope I don't fall, lean, right? And that first step, if any of you have ever done it, you're like, do I really believe this thing's gonna hold me? And you lean back. Do you trust enough in his authority to truly lean in for financial decisions, relational decisions, vocational decisions? To trust him enough generosity to interrupt your agenda, your schedule? Because I think honestly, sometimes what I put my trust in looks more like this. You can't even see it, it's a paper clip. Right, And this is what Jesus was challenging the religious leaders with was that it was all about their religious resume, what they knew, the knowledge they had. Or I put it into my control or my finances or, or whatever it is, my resume. And this was never meant to bear that weight. And if the last two years has taught us anything, we don't have a lot of control. So what are you leaning into what are you trusting with authority in your life what has rule and reign in your life so we're going to look at three parables this morning the parable of the two sons the parable of the tenants and or the rented farms uh and the parable of the wedding banquet so uh let's just dive in to the parable of the two sons here's what it says and here's the big takeaway here on the parable of the two sons Whatever has authority in your life, you're gonna obey, okay? So here's what it says. What do you think? This is Jesus speaking, so that's a good question for us. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered, but later he changed his mind and he went. This is a key phrase here. He changed his mind, okay, and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Next slide. Which one of the two did his father, uh, did what his father wanted? The first they answered, this is the religious leaders answering Jesus. Truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came, this is John the Baptist, to show you the way of righteousness and you did not believe him but the tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe. Repentance is key, right? Repent means to change your mind, resulting in a change of direction, right? It is, a, uh, it is an intellectual agreement, but then it's a volitional action, right? It's an, it, you take a step of faith. You put trust in something. And the difference between the religious leaders of the day and the prostitutes and the tax collectors and those who was that they believed John the Baptist's message to repent and to trust in Jesus, that forgiveness had arrived and that you could have new life and new purpose through him. So what do you trust? See, repenting leads to change in direction. True repentance, true belief is about obedience. Belief is about trusting his authority. John 14, 23, Jesus said this. Anyone who loves me will, here's another word we don't like, obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Jesus said, if you're gonna follow me, you gotta trust in my authority. Will you obey Now, let me elaborate on obedience for just a second because some translations say to keep or to guard or to carefully attend to, but it's still about trust. It's about putting your weight on Jesus. It's trusting his authority enough to submit and follow him. And that's hard, right? That is a daily battle. And sometimes we think submission means subjugation, and that is not the same thing. Let me elaborate on that just for a second. Subjugation, you turn uh, a person into a thing. You destroy their individuality. But in submission, one author says it this way, 
It makes a person become more of what God wants him or her to be. There's freedom in trusting Christ because he knows who you are. I love what Craig Rochelle says about this. He said, he said this, so we, sometimes, we sometimes see obedience to God as some test designed to see if we were really committed to him or love him. But what if it's designed as God's way of giving us what is best for us? And that was John the Baptist's message. And that was Jesus' message. Trust me and I will give you life and life to the full. I wanna show you a new way, a new direction, give you new purpose, a new identity. So what authority, who or what authority do you trust in today? Is it your finances? Is it your resume? Is it your, even a person? We can lean on a person that was never supposed to, you know, and define it by a relationship, that a person who was never supposed to be God in your life. Will you trust in Jesus and obey? What if, what if God's greatest work in you, what if God's greatest work through you is on the other side of a small act of obedience? Let that sit in for a minute. What if God's greatest work that he wants to do in your life and through your life and for your life is on the other side of a small act of obedience? Of, uh, of maybe it's, it's, it's uh, offering forgiveness to someone or being generous or kind or inviting someone to church or saying no to something you know he's, he's asked you not to do and trusting that he knows what's best for you. What if God's greatest work in you is on the other side of a small act of obedience? I mean, if you look at the scriptures, whether it be uh, Abraham or Moses or the apostle Paul or the disciples, what did those guys do? They took a small step of obedience and God showed up. They took another small step of obedience and God showed up. We have no idea what God might do in your life and through your life on the other side of a small act of obedience to trust in him. Let's look at the next parable. The parable of the rented farms or the parable of the tenants. And some of you guys are familiar with this, but this is what it says. Listen, they're all listening. But again, Doug mentioned this last week. Jesus was like, hey, 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 don't miss it. Don't miss it, okay? Listen, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it and dug a wine press in it. He built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants and, uh, to collect his fruit. Now, this was just uh, what we would call this in our day and time would probably be uh, sharecropping. Right? That's basically what this was. And the way this worked is you would have a rich landowner, Jewish or non-Jewish, and he owned a huge vineyard or a huge farm, and he would rent out portions of it to tenants. And then they would work it, and then they would get a portion of the fruit that was produced, and the landowner would get a portion. Now, what's interesting about this parable is that in this day and time, the landowners were notoriously cruel and harsh with the tenants who worked their vineyards often not giving them their fair share. And yet in this parable, we're gonna see the exact opposite happened. Okay, the landowner here is clearly an allusion to God. And so uh, the vineyard being his, the world that he created. Look what happens next. The tenant seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them more than the first time. And the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Remember where we are. Tuesday before the cross. Right? This, Jesus is clearly alluding to himself. He is the heir, the son of God, who's gonna be the risen Christ. And the religious of the day were rejecting his message.
See, they, they, they're going to reject Jesus because they want control and their control, and their control is just a mirage. They're going to condemn him as a messianic pretender and have him killed. Look what happens next. Therefore, the owner of the vineyard comes. What will he do to those tenants? The religious leaders answer and self-indict themselves. He will bring those wretches to a wretch's end, they reply, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Who are the other tenants? It, it'll be the Gentiles, the new covenant of what we just celebrated through communion. It's us. We're the other tenants that Jesus is including us in. That God entrusts us with something. And don't miss it, that, that, that the, the landowner, he comes back and he says, I'm looking for fruit in your life. I'm looking for fruit that you will produce. And this isn't about getting God's favor. But it's what you do with what you have been given. What is our response? What is the fruit that we will bear? Go to verse 42. I'm going to skip this. I'm going to jump right down to 43. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, speaking to the religious leaders of the day, speaking to the insiders of the day, and given to people who will produce its fruit, the fruit of the kingdom. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone whom it falls will be crushed. We're not going to get into the cornerstone. That's a sermon for another day. But basically what Jesus is saying is, do you understand the value of what has been entrusted to you? Do you understand the value of what has been entrusted to you? Doug referenced this last week. He said, do you understand the value of what you have been given? The greatest privilege in the universe is to have a relationship with the one true God through Jesus Christ. And he invites us in. He says, you're forgiven. You're my child. You're my son and daughter. And then what do you do with that? I want to be really, really clear here. You don't earn forgiveness. But when you get new identity, new purpose, new direction, we should be changed. We should have new lives. And it should result in bearing fruit. We see this throughout the scriptures. I'm just going to reference a few here. There's the fruit of righteousness that Jesus references in Matthew 5, 20. That is the fruit of regenerated people, the fruit of good works in Colossians 1, the fruit of transformation of character in Galatians 5, and the fruit of new generations of disciples. One of the last things Jesus says to his disciples and to us in Matthew 28, 18 through 20 is this. All authority, there that word is again, in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore, and he says, Go! You're my representatives. Go, change in direction, take action, produce fruit. What is that fruit? Make disciples. Invite more people to the party of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to, there's the word again, obey, to trust in me, to follow me, to lean into me. Teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So I want to ask you a question real quick. What fruit are you producing in your life? Because what you obey will produce fruit in your life. Whatever your authority is, whatever your trusting is, that is the fruit that will be produced in your life. Whatever authority we serve will produce fruit in your life. And you've been given this amazing gift if you're a believer this morning. And if you're not a believer, pay attention because God wants to invite you into his family, give you a new identity, forgive you of your sins, welcome you into the family, not because of anything you did, but because of what he did, he, he did for you on the cross. And then he's gonna entrust you with something incredible value which is that message of forgiveness, the new identity, the transformation that you can share with others. That is incredibly value. Do you understand the value of been, you've been given? Do you understand the value of the people around you? Starting with the person you look at in the mirror every day. 
You were so valuable that he went to the cross for you and would have done it if you were the only person on the planet. That's how much you're loved. What do you do with that kind of value? What do you do with what's been entrusted to you? We're gonna go on vacation later this summer and we are going to entrust something of great value to our house sitter. Our house is our greatest financial value, right? I don't wanna put too much pressure on them because they're in here, but, but it is, okay? They're gonna watch our home. They're gonna water the plants. They're gonna bring in the mail, all this kind of thing. That is the most valuable thing we know, right? That's the most valuable thing financially that we have. But when my wife texts or calls or checks in, she's not gonna ask about how the brick and mortar is. She's not gonna ask how the pictures are on the wall. She won't even ask about all the plants that I have planted and look awesome, by the way. She's not gonna ask about any of that. She's gonna ask about the two most important lives in our home. And it's not our kids. It's these two right here. These two animals, which are super high maintenance, and cost us a lot of money, and get hair all over our house, we adore, right? They have value to us. We're gonna ask, how are they? How are they doing? Are they okay? Don't forget to give Sophie your medicine, or she's gonna poop all over the house. You know, like we, these dogs have value to us, and they are so high maintenance, we treat them like people, right? But they bring so much joy to us. How there is people you lock eyes with every day that are of huge value to God. Starting with the person in the mirror. You've been given new purpose, new identity. And you may have some high maintenance people in your life like our dogs are. They may, I don't know if they get hair on you, but you know what I'm saying? Like, like, There are people you never lock eyes with anyone who doesn't have incredible value to God. Do you realize that? And he has entrusted you with that message. What will you do with that value that you have, but that you're also called to share? That's what this parable is about. Therefore, I tell you the kingdom of God, you will produce will give into people who produce its fruit. And this isn't about losing your salvation. This is about genuine uh, reception of Jesus's message and following him. We are called to produce fruit. That's his plan A, is to take broken people, high maintenance people like us, to reach other broken, high maintenance people. There are implications to trusting in him. Okay, last parable, the parable of the wedding banquet. I told you it was gonna be a gut punch today, okay? The parable of the wedding banquet, this, uh, verse, uh, Matthew 22, picking up in verse two. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent the servants who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and to tell those that, who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatted cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. Okay, so here's how this worked back in the day. You have a ruling monarch and if you were invited to a banquet, man, that was a big deal. That was a privilege. That was a great honor, right? And basically what he did was he sent out a save the date. Hey, here's the day we're gonna party. And then he would say, Okay, everything's ready. Now come on. And so um, people would come. And you didn't want to miss it. Like it was a privilege to get to go. Like it was the invite of invites. If the ruling monarch, the king over the kingdom invited you to the party. Because he wasn't just providing food. He was giving you like wedding garments and all this stuff. I mean, it was an awesome deal, right? It was better than just any old gift basket, But look what happens. The people who should have responded, it says this, verse five. But they paid no attention and went off 
one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed them, those murderers, and burned their city. You're like, wow, that's tough for a uh, RSV to, RSVP to a wedding, right? Here's the deal. Here's the deal. They paid no attention. We are accountable for what we hear and how we respond. But basically, you know what this word translates best as? They neglected the invitation. I don't know where you are in your faith journey today, but don't neglect the invitation from the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And it says they went off and went to their field and to other business. Basically, they just said, hey, I'm going to work my own little kingdom. That's what I trust in. That's what I want to put all my weight on. And they missed out on a grander story that God was inviting them into. That's the cool thing about this is that there's an invitation from the king of teens. He's writing this great, grand story. And he's inviting us into it. And basically the response of the king is what was reserved by burning down the city was what they reserved for when, a, uh, when subjects revolted or committed treason. There was judgment. Look at the next verses here. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready to go, but those invited do not deserve to come. They wouldn't respond. They had an open invitation, right? There's no cover charge or anything like that. They could come, but they didn't. And so he said, go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you can find. Anyone. You know what this means in Greek? It means anyone. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people that uh, they could find. Now, hey, some of you need to pay attention this morning. Because you came in and you're like, oh, I got to get right with God and all this stuff. Look what it says. The bad as well as the good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. Here's the good news. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. You don't need to get right to come to the banquet. Your current condition doesn't matter. Your current condition doesn't matter. It's about your response. Right? It's about changing your mind and direction. Jesus, I believe you are who you say you are. The son of God who died on the cross for me. And I want to change direction. I want to ask for your, your forgiveness. I can't make myself right, but you can. And I want to be part of the party. What is your response to the king? What is your response to the invitation of the king? It's not about our current condition. It is about our response to the invitation. What are you going to do with it will you trust and obey so here's the three questions who or what has rule and reign in my life do I realize what value has been entrusted to me the value that God sees in you but also the value of the people around you And then what is my response to the invitation of the king? I don't know where you are on your faith journey this morning, but he's inviting you to trust him. Maybe for some of you this morning, it is crossing the line of faith for the first time and trusting him as your forgiver and your leader, trusting in his authority that you will follow, that you will obey. For some of you, I don't, you may be, maybe it's a step of obedience this morning in terms of generosity, in terms of, in terms of serving, in terms of maybe forgiving someone because you realize how much you have been forgiven. What is your response to the invitation of the king? And some of you may be asking this question. I think this is a fair question. Why should I respond? Why should I surrender my life to Jesus? Because that's what he did for you and for me. Jesus modeled what it was to trust in the authority of his father. To submit, to be obedient, and to respond to his heavenly father. 
Philippians 2 says it this way. Speaking of Jesus, who being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Our forgiveness, our gifts, our influence is not to be used to our advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. He submitted being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming, there it is, obedient to death. He was obedient to death because that was his purpose. Even death on a cross. And he did that. He trusted his father, but he did it for me. And he did it for you. Because you have that much value. And he wants to invite us into the party. God is inviting in you into the greatest story ever. And he wants you to be a part of it. Will you trust him enough to put your weight on that and follow him whatever area, whatever it's prompting you with today? I want to ask this question again. What if God's greatest act in you or work in you and through you is on the other, on the other side of a small act of obedience? I'm saying, you know what, God, I really am going to trust you with my finances. And I'm going to obey what you say. I'm gonna trust you with the way you've gifted me with, or the influence that I have, and I'm gonna serve, or I'm going to reach out to that person, or, or God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be obedient to forgive others as you have forgiven me. Do you have any idea what God might do on the other side of a small act of obedience in you? And the answer is no, you don't. But he does. And he still invites us to follow him, to trust him with all of our heart and all of our mind and all of our soul. Let's pray together. <laughs> Heavenly Father, this is a hard teaching. It is convicting especially when I'm, I'm mindful that Jesus spoke these words just a few days before he would hang on the cross and die so that I might live. God, if I'm honest, and I think I could speak for everyone here, we are not naturally obedient. We push against authority. We wanna control. Today, God, I pray that in all humility, we just ask for your forgiveness. In humility, we want to take a small step of faith, whatever that is, to trust you more and see what you might have on the other side of that. Maybe it's crossing the line of faith this morning. And if there's somebody here who hasn't crossed the line of faith, I pray that they would receive you as their forgiver and leader. Or maybe it's an act of generosity or, or using a gift or extending forgiveness to someone. Whatever it is, God, I pray that we would not leave this place without being convicted by your Holy Spirit to take that step boldly. Because you are writing a great story and you invite us to be part of it. I pray that we would submit and trust and follow you. Thank you for the privilege you give us in knowing you and living with you, not just in this life, but in the eternal life. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Hey, you guys are dismissed. Thank you for being here. If you made a decision today or you'd like to visit, I'll be down at the front. If you could do us a favor, would you take your communion cups with you and just dump them in the trash on the way out? Happy Father's Day, all you guys.